people have been creating money uh, or currencies for thousands and thousands of years. And in just about every single one of these stories, it always starts with a new ruler, a virtuous society, a new currency. They keep it strong. They expand. Everybody trades in the currency. Then uh, they expand some further. Then they have to fight a war. Then they print more money to fight the war. Then they debase the currency. Pretty soon, uh, the currency isn't worth anything. People don't want to trade with them because they debased the currency. They inflated it away. And then at some point, the soldiers realize that the money they're being paid in is worthless or, or the soldiers don't get paid. And when the soldiers don't get paid, they all mutiny or they desert. Saylor, a renowned billionaire business executive, has emerged as a prominent figure in the cryptocurrency industry due to his bullish views on Bitcoin and insightful analyses of complex topics. His deep interest in history, particularly the narrative of Western civilization, is evident from his extensive reading habits, as detailed in a 1996 Washington Post article. Sailor's exploration of historical patterns has led him to a compelling conclusion. Civilizations often decline when they debase their currency, a trend he believes the United States is not immune to. In a recent interview with Crypto Nutshell, Sailor discussed his admiration for The Story of Civilization by Will and Ariel Durant, an extensive 11-volume series. He emphasized that his study of history has taught him a crucial lesson about the fate of civilizations, which he believes applies to the current economic landscape. Sailor's conviction in Bitcoin stems from its ability to address the need for a truly scarce and desirable asset without reliance on any intermediary. He sees this quality as vital in safeguarding against the pitfalls of currency debasement. Through his insights and advocacy for Bitcoin, Sailor has become a leading voice in the cryptocurrency space, offering valuable perspectives on its potential role in shaping the future of finance. It's not a dozen times. It's not a hundred times. If you read this, it's thousands and thousands of times you see the rise and the decline and the fall and, and the reemergence. And there are always these common principles. And the principles have to do with uh, power. And it goes on like that. It's always about harnessing power, harnessing and channeling energy. And you've got the physical energy, and that's how people win the wars. And then you have the economic energy. And all the really good societies, they manage to create trading networks on a solid, a strong currency that people trust. And then eventually the grandson of the person that set it up gets a bit cheaper. And then the great grandkids get a bit cheaper. They start fighting amongst each other, them, each other. Then they debase the currency. Then their armies, you know, their armies desert them and their trading partners don't want to trade with them. And all of the commercial energy bypasses them and then they blame it on the barbarians and it starts anew. So that's all in Will Durant. If you read it and what you realize, there's just nothing new under the sun. <laughs> Everything's been played out. And, and history is almost the story of a bunch of uh, arrogant alpha males that are a bit ignorant that think that this time it's different and they were put on earth to fix things. And they go, you know, Alexander the Great goes gallivanting off, you know, in his late teenage years. And of course we call him the Great, but the joke is after he basically, you know, conquered 200 countries and lost all of his army, he died by age 33 and everything collapses within months after he's dead. So it's like you can do this stuff for a year, two years, 10 years, and then everything collapses under its own weight. And and it goes on and on and on like that. So I, I really like listening uh, to that or reading those histories. I think you can learn a lot from them. And the most useful thing you can learn is this is not the first, first time this has been done. In fact, it, it's, it's common throughout human history. Every single c civilization, it failed because either it couldn't channel power, it was less powerful technically from an engineering point of view right? Or because it couldn't channel capital, like economic power and its, and its monetary systems were, were uh, completely defective or they were inferior, right? The society that trades glass beads gets stomped on by the society that trades metal coins and the ones that trade gold coins stomp on the ones that trade copper coins. And, and then even then you believe that gold is money. The Spaniards go off, conquer the new world. They bring back all the gold it doesn't solve the problem because they inflate the gold supply by a factor of five. So they created hyperinflation. Their own economy collapsed and the Spanish empire collapsed because they didn't understand uh, the implications of, of inflating the money supply. And uh, they figured that out the hard way 1,700 years after the Romans figured it out. And they figured it out 500 years after the Greeks figured it out. And 
It happened in Egypt and it happened in Assyria and it happened in China. And it's, it's, it's happened as many times as we can write it down. And it's probably yeah. happened a hundred thousand times that we didn't write down. And so, yeah, I, I encourage people to read history, especially good, uh, good political history, good economic history. <laughs> And uh, 1500, uh, in 1500, they were using paintings as a store of value in Italy, right? That's, that's an interesting thing that comes out, you know? Uh, you, you'll find all of these principles just keep popping up. How do you find scarce, desirable assets to store your value in a, in a portable fashion? And if you read it, then you'll say, wow, Bitcoin would have solved that problem. The risk-reward proposition for Bitcoin in the year 2024 is, um, is better than any other time in the history of the asset because because you have institutional adoption, you have regulatory clarity, you see capital coming into the space, and yet still you can do the survey yourself. Ask a hundred of your friends if if they're fully invested in Bitcoin and if they understand it. And if 95 say no, right, I would say do your own research. But Bitcoin's 15 years old. So let's look at other great investments. 15 years after Manhattan was founded, was it a good investment? We could just start from, we could start 200 years after Mount Manhattan was founded. In 1776, roll the clock forward, 1791. Was it a good investment? In, was real estate in Manhattan in 1791 a good investment? Was it a good investment in 1865 after the Civil War? Was it a good investment in 1970? Was it a good investment 15 years afterwards in, you know, 1995? Like, it's, was it a good investment in London 20 years ago? Like, 2,000 years after the Romans showed up in London, was it a good investment to buy London property, right? I mean, these are scarce, desirable properties, right? It's, it's 15 years late is not late, right? That, the difference between the winners and the losers is the winners buy something valuable and the losers are afraid, right? The losers are afraid to buy the valuable thing because it's too expensive. New York real estate was the most expensive real estate in the United States. 300 years late. As I'd said, the real key is to understand what is Bitcoin's use case. It's use ca it's digital capital. Well, how big is that? $400 trillion, right? How much capital is, is locked up in real estate, equity, currency, bonds, collectibles, trophy assets, precious metals in the year 2024? Right, it's pr probably half the value of most uh, residential real estate is the monetary premium. It's the capital. So, like, how, how do you know this? I, I give you a little test. Uh, go to Miami Beach, go up and down the beach, and then count the number of lights on in a condo building on the beach. Or go to go to Monaco and count the number of lights on. And what you'll find is that uh, eighty to ninety percent of all of the condos don't have lights on at night. So people have huge amounts of capital tied up in these uh, these idle assets. And, and there's a lot of reasons for them, but one reason is because they feel like their money is safer there. So in the 20th century, people basically bought sports teams. I mean, ask yourself, what do rich people own when they get rich? They bought sports teams. They bought real estate. They bought companies. They bought land. They bought timber rights. They bought oil rights. They bought gold. They bought, you know, bonds. They just bought stuff. Why? Because they knew if they left their money in the bank... It was going to dwindle away. Is it too late? Well, can you actually take all of your property, put it in your pocket and leave the country on one day notice if you need to? If not, then you're probably not too late. So Bitcoin represents digital property. What's the value of digital property? Hundreds of trillions of dollars. Is it overvalued? Not yet. It's a trillion dollars right now. So when it's a hundred times more valuable than it is right now, will it be overvalued? Not likely. It's probably still going to be appreciating faster than every other thing you can buy. Why? Because it's better than every other thing you can buy.